Welcome to the LV Living Life Podcast. If you like my content, don't forget to support me by hitting the subscribe, notification, and like buttons. Today's special guest is April. She's also an Instagrammer. She goes by blue underscore turtle underscore woman. Hey, welcome to my show there, April. Good morning, and thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me. Now, April um, reached out to me about my racism episode a little while back and commended me on bringing awareness to it. She explained how she was at an exhibit at the Museum of Vancouver. The exhibit was called uh, Seat at the Table, and it talked about the head tax and everything. Now, she mentioned to me that she was unaware of how much racism the Chinese people received. So she's going to talk a little bit about that, and then she's going to bring awareness to the 60s scoop with the Indigenous children out there. Uh, and it's something that she shed a lot of light on for me. I was totally unaware of this and, and actually pretty shocked. Uh, so anyways, uh, yeah, why don't you talk about that exhibit at the Museum of Vancouver first there, April? Thanks. For sure. Um, you know, because we're all in a pandemic and kind of stuck at home, I try to do something for myself once a week by getting out and so that's very smart um, <laughs> it is and because it's a pandemic not a lot of people are going to art galleries and museums so mm-hmm. it's nice to go and not have a lot of people around if you've never been to the museum of vancouver it is an excellent place to learn about historical events and stuff that happened here in vancouver mm-hmm. and different communities especially the asian community i walk into this exhibit and there was a part of it that it had a bunch of Chinese lanterns mm-hmm. and on the sides of each one of them was all these racist, horrible things that were said and written about Asian people. Yeah. And and that's when it hit me because as an Indigenous woman, I can relate to that, mm-hmm. you know, living, living under the Indian Act where I'm not considered a human being and, you know, just everybody kind of working against you. Yeah, I get it. And truly, thank you for reaching out to me and really hit me too. Like when you said, oh, no, I can, I understand. And I was like, well, geez, thank you. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about the indigenous children being placed, like you called it the 60s scoop, and it is called the 60s scoop, um, taking away children from indigenous families and placing them with white families, uh, middle-class white families, and that's still going on somewhat today. But back in the day, I mean, yeah, please shed some light on that. I know, I know you and I discussed it a little bit before, and it's truly mind-blowing. Like, I'm born and raised here, for one. I'm adopted yeah. as well. One thing, I don't know anything about the Museum of Vancouver, so shame on me for that. <laughs> <laughs> Being born actually in Vancouver and raised here and not knowing that, like, I, call me an idiot, but whatever. <laughs> but I'll, I'll definitely go check that out with my friends. And thank you for sharing that. Please shed some light on this um, 60s scoop, and were you a part of that as well? So just a little uh, history about kind of where the 60s scoop originated. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of the residential school era. Mm -hmm. The 60s scoop is actually just an extension of that, um, where the Canadian government still continues, even to this day, they want to, you know, assimilate Indigenous people. And in order to do that, to break a community down, you know, you take away the children. Mm -hmm. And so... They realized that the the residential school uh, they weren't working, and so and people were also catching on that there was horrific things happening at these schools. So the government started shutting shutting them down. Starting, I think it was in the fifties, mm-hmm. and to continue what they were doing, they started apprehending indigenous children from their families. And that's insane. Either yeah, and either you were placed in the foster care system which I was for the first three months, um, I was taken away as a newborn. Mm-hmm. And then either you were kept in the foster care system and bounced around until you aged out, or they put you up for adoption into usually white families. Yeah. And, you know, we were adopted. A lot of us stayed in Canada, but also a lot of us went to the States, Australia, Germany. We were we went worldwide. Yeah, I read somewhere... That um, I think you and I kind of mentioned that there's like what Stats Canada put down is something like 20,000 people, 20,000 children. But in Mm -hmm. reality, you're saying it's up to about 100,000 maybe. The 60 Scoop actually had a a settlement with the Canadian government. 
And I was part of a committee out here in Vancouver. We were a team of lawyers and other Indigenous organizations and some chiefs of some local um, communities. Mm -hmm. We were actually trying to stop it because this settlement excluded a lot of people. It excluded non-status Inuit and Métis as well. Okay. And uh, we just wanted everybody to be included. And so when we were going about this process, we learned that the information that we were given about how many people were actually apprehended was incorrect because the provinces never kept track of how many children they took away. Yeah. And so we were learning that the number was probably around 100,000 children. Yeah. I don't think it I don't think that was the first thing that crossed their mind was to keep track of this when they're trying to get rid of things, right? Like I I just felt that that you're right. I think those numbers are skewed a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't even imagine like how a child would feel like at, at a young age when they can f- kind of grasp what's going on and to be stripped away from your family and your siblings and to be placed in another home or to be placed in foster care or an orphanage until they age out. I can't even imagine, I can't even fathom that. Like it, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Like um, I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm speechless. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I do a lot of volunteer work here in the downtown east side um, mm-hmm. through, you know, a hom- homeless organization. And, you know, a lot of us have chosen to cope with the loss and the shame and the anger through, you know, mm-hmm. substance abuse. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, good for you for helping people down there. Mm-hmm. I remember we were at a Canada Day celebration and uh, there was a mapping of the world there and it said place where your family's originally from, right? And there was like, you know, thousands of pins on this map. And uh, of course, majority of the pins were in Canada. (laughs) And I was kind of like, uh, I don't think so. (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't, I I get it that if you're, you know, second, third, fourth generation, if you want to say that, uh, that you're Canadian, but realistic that's not where your family's from so i'm i'm kind of like split between two so i needed two pins <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and they weren't in canada <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so i felt that this land is always uh, it's indigenous people that that were here first so i'm sorry mm-hmm. if, if you feel that you were here first i don't i don't think so i don't think so <laughs> yeah well, I really hope that it gets better. I hope there's an end to it. And I hope that people, this talking about this and bringing awareness to it, and I hope people can understand, like parents out there, this happened and this is happening. Like, how would it feel like if your child was stripped away from you and put into another family without any and it, choice? And it's not, it's not just about adoption. You're, you're taking the child away from culture and mm-hmm. language and, and traditions and You know, I'm 45 years old and I'm just learning all of this stuff now. Yeah, no, exactly. And I don't want the parents out there to feel that, like just to understand I'm a parent. So I know that would devastate me. Um, And same goes with uh, like, I can't even imagine, like I said earlier, I can't imagine what a kid would feel like. I remember uh, when I was younger and I was shopping at Woodward and my mom and I got kind of split up. My adopted mom, I'm adopted by the way, and I think you know mm-hmm. that already. The mom and I got split away, and but that she was all I knew back then, right? Right. You know, and I was probably like four years old maybe, and all of a sudden I just panicked and I felt so lost and I don't know. And I can't imagine if you're stripped away for life. That's just insane to me. I'm right. speechless. I recently reconnected with my birth mom and, and it's going great. I, I mean, uh, I'm so happy that, you know, after 49 years, I found her. No, her and her husband are, are amazing. And I know they're listening right now. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I can't wait till this pandemic's over. He's such a kind guy. They're very, re- he's very receptive. Um, and yeah, I couldn't ask for anything more, uh, but to keep building on that relationship. But to be placed out of your home, like out of your will and... Um, to even I don't know like how do you reconnect like have you been able to reconnect with your birth family uh for sure about uh about 20 years ago I did I did an adoption search okay and um it turned out that my mother my mother actually went to residential school okay and unfortunately she was deceased at the time oh sorry Um, yeah and I have three brothers and two sisters okay and so I've been able to reconnect with them. Um, funny story, my one sister, 
she was also part of the 60 scoop as well she was adopted by a family and she lived like 10 miles from me <laughs> oh right wow now. geez yeah. and you guys didn't know yeah like i we mean 10 miles is a far distance right yeah yeah our, our fathers were in the rcmp together and are you kidding that's that's wild <laughs> wow it's insane um but how's yeah. your relationship um you know I have a really good friend of mine who she kind of specializes in adoption. Mm-hmm. And so what, bef- before I did my search, she she made me read a lot of material on adoption reunions. And, yeah. you know, sometimes they're not, it's not the big happy family. Like no, you're right. Yep. We've come from different lives. And so we keep in touch. Yeah. I would like to be a little bit closer with them. Yeah. Like, but, you know. It is, just it is what it is. Different. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I reconnected with my mom and, and it's going well. And uh, the pandemic kind of put a little hiccup into it. But you're right. I used to watch this uh, adopted child show on TLC or something. I forget what it's called. Sorry. I mean, when, once I remember, I'll, I'll let you know. But I mm-hmm. used to watch that before I found my mom. And you'd see a lot of uh, happy sadness, right? Right. <laughs> and right. Uh, But you're right. You're absolutely right. Because I know some people that actually found their, their birth parents or whatever, their birth families, and it didn't go well. And, right. uh, and it actually, um, some of it actually wrecked families, right? And I was willing to take any chance to actually just find my birth mom and and go from that way. Now, my birth dad, I found him or he he found me. I'm going to share this story closer to April, probably. But yeah, it's it's it was pretty wild. And uh, and yeah, and him and I, we don't we don't even talk. So and it's not a big deal. It it is what it is. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, But it is like you're right, because some families do get pretty messed up or you just don't know what happened during those years of not living together and not you know going through life together right it's so different right. yeah and i don't think you really understand that unless you're an adopted person <laughs> exactly no, yeah exactly. yeah so i know people out there they're like oh you know you're adopted i'm never i was never ashamed of being adopted it doesn't doesn't bother me at all mm-hmm. but my mm-hmm. situation and your situation are two to- totally different stories sure. yeah yeah yours is a little bit like there's definitely a lot of stuff that would that would boil my blood and uh yeah (laughs) how are you adapting with like starting to understand the indigenous culture and how are you grasping all that so it actually wasn't until i think it's four years ago now okay i didn't even i didn't even know i was from the 60s scoop i had never heard of it Mm -hmm. myself yeah um my parents just told me i was adopted i didn't know that this was going on yeah and and it rocked my world i was shaken to the core of course yeah um i was also at a point in my life where i was really wanting to engage with my culture but i didn't know how to because i was terrified Mm -hmm. and but this just knowing that information about myself i just dove in head first and got into the ceremony right away and awesome learning with elders it's been life-changing in a good way good good and i'm learning and i'm learning that everything that my adoptive family told me about indigenous people Mm -hmm. like we're alcoholics and we're on welfare and all the horrible stereotypes yeah we're all it was all a lie yeah i'm happy that it's your you know honestly that's probably like a healing process for you absolutely yeah and i'm proud of you for that good for you Mm -hmm. um yeah i have an indigenous friend myself and she went through a lot of red tape just to adopt her nephew um Mm -hmm. and and finally successful uh but that's family like and it was so hard to adopt a a family right like i i just don't i don't understand that their own yeah so i since learning about my culture and with that comes learning about all our injustices as well. Mm -hmm. When you look at how indigenous people have been treated historically since day one, Mm -hmm. my personal theory is indigenous people have the most valuable thing land. Mm -hmm. And I think in order for the government to obtain that land, to exploit, you know, the valuable resources that come with that is, to inflict genocide on a culture and that's sending children to residential school and taking the children away and and demoralizing women and that's why nothing's ever been done about murdered or missing indigenous women and 
Yeah. That's just my perspective on it. Yeah. No, no and I understand it. I, I've said this before, like, I'm so proud to be Canadian, but then mm-hmm. the stuff that happens, you know, in the past and, and whatever, it, it's right. it's a bit... Our education system needs to change drastically. Yeah, I um, agree. I didn't learn about the residential school era until I was in college 10 mm-hmm. years ago, mm-hmm. you know? That's absurd. I should know. We should know about this. Yeah, that's a, that's maybe something you should start talking about. Absolutely, I think so. Yeah, and it's uh, you know a lot of our our history is nasty. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is nasty, but you know I, I know I know other countries aren't much better either. But no, um, yeah. but you know you got to talk about it and you got to own up to it and you got to you know pass mm, pass your sure. apologies and uh and i think that's how we end up building and and healing honestly i think that's my opinion anyways absolutely you know april i i truly truly thank you for sharing this story with me and uh and it and it really hit me especially how we we kind of talked about this before this episode actually and um yeah he, if if my listeners and and viewers can actually see my face or um to see my well, how i expressed it earlier like it was just uh, it's mind-blowing i, di- I didn't sure. know i didn't yeah. know and i'm sorry well, now, that, i'm sorry that i didn't know yeah well and now you do and now you can you know we need allies like you to yeah you know be a voice for us oh, you not betcha. a lot of people not a lot of people want to listen to us <laughs> well i'm here <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, April, I thank you so much, and I and I truly hope you go on this healing path, and uh, and you and you just start healing. Absolutely. <laughs> like I can't even think of any other word for it. But uh, I really thank you for sharing your story with me and bringing awareness to this. And uh, I thank you for helping me, like uh, and commending me on on my racism episode and mm-hmm. uh, feeling the same thing. And and that that, that speaks volumes to you as well. Uh, that's yeah. something that you know. I think a lot of Canadians were unaware of that. You know, the Chinese yeah. got head taxed, and uh, you know, like I read in your thing, it says twenty-one million dollars worth is which, which is worth the one point five billion today. And you know, the, a lot yeah. of a uh, lot of the Asians, and they got strapped with C fours, and you know, go and blow up that tunnel. And if that person was blown to smithereens, so be it. You know, it didn't matter. Yeah. We have a nasty history in Canada and, and other countries as well. And like I said, I think that the best thing to do is, you know, educate people. And uh, like you say, maybe bring it into the school system and talk about it as nasty as it is. And, sure. I, and I think kids need to know that, know what happened in the past and, and change that. Because I feel kids are a lot better now. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that kids don't have to deal with most of that anymore. And uh, you know, I know I know there's there's other issues out there, and like Black Lives Matter, the Indigenous mm-hmm. people, the Asians. Like we we've all been through it, and uh, I hope I hope we definitely heal and fix it. So again, April, thank you so much for shedding light on this and and making me aware of it. And uh, hopefully, some of my listeners will understand it as well and spread it. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in my culture, we always, when we finish saying something important, we say all my relations, which means that we are all related. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that. If you're not following April, give her a follow. I'm sure she's open to talking about anything if you want to message Absolutely. her. Absolutely. If you want to message her as well. And again, she goes by uh, blue underscore turtle underscore woman. What does that stand for, by the way? <laughs> so actually, Blue Turtle Woman is my traditional name. Okay. I was named by a, I was named by a medicine man a couple of years ago at a sweat lodge. Um, I've actually also legally changed my name back to my birth name as well. Yeah. Which is which is pretty cool. So that's part of my healing journey. And awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, see, I knew there was a story behind it. That's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> my name's really easy because Albie's my nickname, and I'll be like, "Hey, right. it's, it's almost like I'll be living life." But so, I'll be living, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I'm living life. There you go. All right. Well, to my listeners, please support me by uh, again hitting the subscribe button if you like my content, and I'll catch you guys next week. Thanks.